Welcome to the Intimate Marriage Podcast, where I teach educated, successful couples how to have incredible, passionate relationships so that you can stop compromising and start feeling fully alive in your relationship. I'm Alexandra Stockwell, aka The Intimacy Doctor. I'm a physician, a relationship and intimacy coach, and I'm an intimate marriage expert. My husband and I have been married for 26 years. We have four children and full professional lives, and we've created an amazing marriage. I've shown hundreds of couples how to do so as well. So if you want to deepen your understanding of your own relationship and learn to access new heights of emotional, sensual, and erotic intimacy, you're in the right place. I will show you how. Now, let's dive in. A warm welcome to you, Laura Doyle. I'm going to introduce you, but I really just want to say it's really a treat, both personally and professionally, to have you on the Intimate Marriage Podcast. Thank you, Alexandra. That's so sweet. It's great to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely. I'm going to read your official bio just because it almost reads like, um, not like a romance novel, but it just is a beautiful read the way it's written. So, New York Times bestselling author Laura Doyle was the perfect wife until she actually got married. When she told her husband how to be tidier, more romantic, and more ambitious, he avoided her. So she dragged him to marriage counseling and nearly divorced him. In desperation, she asked happily married women for their secrets, and that's when she got her miracle. The man who wooed her returned. Laura's books have been translated into 19 languages in 30 countries and started a worldwide movement of women who practice the six intimacy skills. She founded an international relationship coach training school, is the star of Empowered Wives on Amazon Prime and host of the Empowered Wife podcast. Laura has appeared on the Today Show, Good Morning America, and The View. And I just want to share that personally, From 2010 to 2012, I lived in a rural area in southwest Kansas. Everyone in the area was quite conservative. There were 40 churches and no bookstores. And I had moved there from Massachusetts. So I was used to a much more diverse environment, really, in every regard. And so all of my friends were conservative Christians, which was a new experience for me to be so immersed in the evangelical Midwest. And they loved your book, The Surrendered Wife, which was published a while ago. And they all just adored it. But what I understood from what they said is that the key to a great happy marriage is that whatever your husband says, you just say yes to it, which I found repulsive. I mean, I could see that that would go a little ways, but that wasn't going to take me all the way for sure. But anyway, I just left it there, intrigued that you really touched these women's hearts, but what they were able to tell me didn't work for, like, it just didn't draw me in. And now Mm -hmm. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, and the next time that I encountered huge fans of your work was actually the Hasidic ultra-Orthodox Jewish community. I know you've been interviewed in some of their big publications, and the women there really take what you say to heart and I've seen some remarkable impact. And so that just really intrigued me because I think of those two audiences as sharing, they share a certain understanding of a woman's role versus a man's role, but otherwise it's not a lot of overlap. And then in the meantime, I have a good friend that I've known since I was 18, I'm 54 now, and she lives in Germany and was separated from her husband anticipating divorce. And she while she's a spiritual person, for the purposes of this conversation, I'm going to say she's secular. She found your book, and 
is now together with her husband, very happy and in your training program to become a relationship coach using your methods. So that's just a patchwork from my little piece of the planet in relationship to your work. And so I want to set the context for my listeners and also share your official bio as I have and my personal context as I, again, welcome you to this conversation. I'm really glad you're here. Wow, Alexandra, that I'm so delighted to hear about your experience. That is, that was really fun for me uh, to hear about um, the conservative Christians in Kansas, and then the Hasidic Jews in San Francisco, and then your friend in Germany, um, and and the, and maybe uh, different perspectives, right, that people share about what the content of the material is. Uh, so anyway. That, that's very fun. What a, what a great way to start off our, our conversation. Yes, exactly. And I have to say, it's when my friend who's secular shared the impact of your work and actually was speaking with me since I'm a relationship coach and was asking a few of my opinions before she decided to enroll in your program. That really got my attention in a new way. So I bought your book and read it then and was happy to now receive the updated version with the new additions that you've recently made to The Empowered Wife. And maybe to also give more context for listeners, would you share your fundamental paradigm? I could do it and would have fun, but you as a writer and speaker are pithy and profound in a kind of fun blend. So I'd love to hear what is your fundamental pivot or invitation to women, which ends up leading towards really satisfying marriage? Mm. It started when I drove my marriage into a ditch, my own marriage, right? It was uh, really in a bad way. And uh, we've been going to marriage counseling for over a year, and we spent $9,000. And he wanted nothing to do with me. He was more interested in watching reruns on TV than he was in spending time with me or even making love to me. And um, I decided that I was going to have to divorce him. So I uh, that's what I, I got ready to do. I was sitting on the marriage counselor's great couch. I remember I thought, this is never going to work. He's never going to change. I'm either going to spend the rest of my life in a loveless marriage or uh, I have to get divorced. So I was going to get divorced. And uh, then the problem was that I was too embarrassed to do that. I uh, had invited people to the wedding not that many years before, right, saying, you know, this is the one, and, you know, I'm sure, and <laughs> we're going to make it. <laughs> and um, I just didn't want that loss of status, if I'm honest. So then I, I interviewed the, the happy women and, and got their tips, and uh, and I thought, I have nothing to lose here. I'm going to experiment with all of these crazy things they're saying, because the things they said didn't make any sense to me. They were not like anything I'd learned growing up. Uh, certainly not. And they weren't even like things I read in marriage books. I'd read all the marriage books. Um, so I uh, made my marriage into a laboratory. I, I would try things. And uh, if they worked, I kept them. If they didn't, I threw them out. And I just remember it was not that long after that that I uh, I came home one day. And as I walked through the door, my husband saw me. His face me. He was happy to see me again. And that had been gone. So I thought, this is, something's working. We're on to something here. And uh, I remember being very excited because I thought, now I'm going to finally have the kind of marriage I've always wanted. I'd really always wanted a, a wonderful marriage. I wanted that so badly. And, um, and I thought, now you know we won't have these horrible fights in the car like we've been having. And anyway, so uh, not that long after that, we're driving in the car, and we have one of those horrible fights. And I could hear myself saying things I was going to regret, and he was saying horrible things. Like that. And I had the, uh, this sinking feeling like, that. oh, why, why is this happening? Now I know what to do. And how tragic would it be to lose my marriage now that I know what to do, even though um, uh, the truth was I really couldn't get myself to do it. So I had this idea that if I could en enroll all my friends in trying to do it with me, uh, then that might give me the motivation that I needed to, to get through. 
And that's what I did. I got, uh, there were five of us. We'd meet in their living room. They were complaining about their marriages too. So we all started trying these things together. And that was uh, kind of a miraculous experience because we saw that everybody was getting great results. Uh, and it did give me that jolt of motivation to keep going. I remember thinking like I wanted to say something to my husband and I thought, oh, those women are counting on me to, to be my best self. Uh, and so, it, and it helped me be my best self. And I felt more dignified. I felt more relaxed. I felt more confident. I felt happier. Uh, so there were a lot of wins about it. And um, one of the women in that group said, hey, can you write down what we're learning for my cousin in Florida? And we're in California. And I said, sure. And so I did. And that ended up becoming the book of Surrender Life. And um, it was immediately went to the New York Times bestseller list and uh, translated into 19 languages in 30 countries and um, has really started this, um, you know, I would say an accidental worldwide movement of women who practice the six intimacy skills. And so for me, the six intimacy skills are just something, uh, I mean, I think about how there was never relationships 101 at my schools. Maybe there wasn't at yours either. I haven't seen them at too many schools. I learned uh, sentence diagramming and differential equations, but never how to have a a peaceful, you know, playful, passionate relationship. Um, and um, just like if you want to learn to play piano or if you want to learn to drive a car or make an omelet, right, there's skills that you can learn from people that are good at it already. Uh, and so uh, uh, so that's the offer. Um, I, I now have that marriage that I always dreamed of where my husband um, just grabs me uh, around the waist and gives me a kiss when I'm passing him in the hallway, right? Or I'll be sitting, I'm working on my laptop on the, couch or something and he comes and he has to sit right next to me even though i'm not paying any attention to him he just seeks out my company and um and i just want every woman who wants to have um a, an intimate passionate relationship playful relationship to know about these skills and and get it access to them and get the support that she needs to implement them because uh i'm on a mission to end world divorce you know marriages great relationships matter uh, and, uh, I wanted to help women, uh, know how to do that and, and also to feel validated. Like you mentioned that the, the, uh, the conservative Christian women had said, oh, you just say yes to everything your husband says. Well, that wouldn't work for me either. You know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I totally I'm well know educated. that now. <laughs> yeah. I'm a feminist. I, uh, you know, uh, my opinion counts. I'm kind of a spark plug of a person with a lot to say. And, uh, so, uh, you got, you have to feel, uh, validated. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I just think, uh, women have such emotional brilliance and these other gifts that we bring to the relationship and to the world and the, the relationship and the world need those gifts. Uh, so that, that's a very important part of things too, is being able to be authentic and really honor yourself. So we spend a lot of time, uh, you know, with students on my campus. Um, yeah, we, we spend a lot of time talking about how to best honor yourself in a dignified but also respectful way. Yeah, it's really beautiful for anyone who has been listening to my podcast for a while. They would immediately hear the alignment with what you say. I use different language. I What I often say is that having a fantastic relationship is a learnable skill. And the only issue is that we don't have the education, which of course is comparable to what you've just yeah. said. And yes. I also talk about personal responsibility, which isn't actually something that I don't recall seeing that that those particular words in your book, even though I would say it's an umbrella term which encapsulates all of the things you actually do say. And in that context, I have a question because while I know that you work exclusively with women, and I work primarily with couples, my experience in my version of this empowering work is it, it applies to men as well. In other words, there are times when men really want to work on their relationships and in in, on their marriages in a heteronormative context. I think there's actually more and more of a trend as women are so much more ambitious and or their ambition has a place for expression and they are professionally successful that that provides a context where I have 
a good number of men who read my book and reach out to me and want to do this work. And sometimes their wives just aren't interested or aren't available. And so the work begins with the man. And I have seen such beautiful results when a man takes personal responsibility for his happiness and pays more attention to what his woman actually wants, whether or not she's conveying that explicitly and regardless of her tone when she does so. So my question for you is, knowing that you work exclusively with women and that there are these wonderful gifts that come with being someone with feminine biology and ways, which, as you and I would agree, includes being powerful and eloquent, but it includes a lot of things related to intuition and emotional brilliance, as you said. So I'm wondering, in this conversation, which I know men will listen to, do they just have the treat, the delightful opportunity to hear two women talking about things that apply just to women? Or for a man listening, is there something that you would invite him to take up as well? Well, I think uh, I think one thing that I can offer to men is the validation of, um, I, I mean, I think one of the things that was astonishing to me to recognize, to realize, uh, and it took me a long time to figure it out about men, uh, is that, uh, it, well, what happened is I asked thousands of men this question. The question was, uh, how important is it to you that your wife is happy? Mm -hmm. So I've asked thousands of men. And they all said the same thing. They all said, it's very important, or it's the most important thing. In the UK, they said it's imperative. <laughs> so the, across the board, this, there was this answer, right? And so, and it's interesting because I know um, when my marriage was broken down, I really was convinced that my husband didn't care about my happiness at all. Uh, and a lot of my students would say the same thing. Oh, no, he doesn't care. He really doesn't. And uh, happily, you know, we were all wrong. So when the wife learns a few of these skills, and, there's, and you touched on them beautifully, Alexandra, like no matter what her tone, you know, no matter how she's responding, what is it she really wants, even though she's not communicating it. Uh, and that's a lot of what we talk about in the intimacy skills, like how to express your desires in a way that inspires. Uh, so I'll give you a little example. Like uh, one of the things I used to do in the battle days, uh, I didn't know how to express my desires in a way that inspired us. So I used to just complain to my husband. So I would say things like, um, John, this kitchen is a disaster area. And I thought he would um, jump up off the couch, turn off the TV, you know, and come and uh, clean the kitchen. And um, you're smiling because that never happened, right? We know that's not how it works. I'm also and smiling I because I evolved from that to say to my husband, do you want to clean the kitchen? And he just would look at me, do I want to? Like that, <laughs> yeah, like, that was no. a nicer version. <laughs> Same fail. Same fail. Same fail. So there's lots of ways to say it wrong. <laughs> um, and, and so my, my particular one, I think my particular one was, Maybe one of the worst because a disaster, right? It's like over dramatized, complaining, you know, criticizing sort of thing. So, anyway, I, and I have a theory that um, men, especially, but maybe no one can really hear us when we're complaining, right? It's like, John, wow, 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 like a peanuts parents or something. So, um, anyway, finally, I learned this magical formula, which honestly, you know, if you're listening and you want a powerful formula for igniting your husband's. Hero gene, here it is. Uh, write it down. It's um, I would love, and then just the final outcome, just the final outcome, not the how. So I would. So I finally said um, one night, I just said I would love a clean kitchen. That's all I said. That was it. And he goes, okay, I'll clean it, and he did. And he's been doing it ever since. It's been over twenty years. I never do the dishes at my house. My husband always does it. Why? Because he knows it makes his wife happy. What does he care about? What is the most important thing? Or uh, what is imperative to him to make his wife happy? So this was a happy, uh, you know, happy discovery for both of us, right? Because he feels good getting to be my hero. In fact, that makes him feel loved. Uh, and I'm very appreciative uh, about the dishes. I, I, I you know, I, Thank him almost every day, like, wow, this kitchen looks so clean. This is so beautiful. 
uh, try not to take that for granted because um, it's really making my life so much better by doing that. Yeah, it's so magnificent. I'm also just smiling over here because you experienced it in your own marriage. I became a relationship coach before understanding these things that we're talking about. And the very first couple that I coached, I heard how in the intimacy of the couple's coaching, she talked to me about her husband and how she talked to him. And I was astonished at how disrespectful it was, except that just about a breath behind that in the back of my head, I realized, oh my goodness, I speak to my husband that way too. And so I was just so grateful to learn that and then start figuring it out in the context of my own marriage. And I would love for people to be able to implement what you teach. Of course, getting the empowered wife, the new addition is a great move. But would you just talk about each of the six intimacy skills a little bit to give a flavor of the oh, landscape oh, of what your invitation and promise really is? Absolutely. In fact, uh, yeah, this is my mission in life. I just want every woman to have all these skills. So, and they are spelled out step by step in the empowered wife. And I'll only be able to give a little taste of each one in the in the short yes, time that we're course, together. Yes, of course, of course. I really, yeah, I really want them, yeah, to have. Uh, to at least know about them. And you touched on uh, respect. And I just love your story about, and this isn't this the great thing about being a relationship coach is you hear, you know, I, I think, you know, my students so much time, so often they bring the thing that I'm like, oh my gosh, that was what I needed to hear today too for my marriage, right? Like I, this is keeping me inspired or I'll, I'll have what she's having, right? Because she's got um, such a beautiful uh, way of Choosing her faith in her husband instead of her fears that everything's going to go completely or whatever. So, uh, yeah. So let's talk about respect just a little bit because that's a, that's one of my favorites. Um, so, and, uh, I thought I grew up knowing that you should be respectful. I think we all know you should be respectful, but I also was a little confused about it because I thought it was something that you give to an authority figure. So kind of back to always saying yes to your husband or whatever, <laughs> like he's the boss and I'm the, subservient person here and I'm like well, I'm not having that so uh yeah I thought respect is like for your teacher your parents your boss uh but also I was respectful right I was respectful about to my husband except for maybe the way he dressed and the way he drove and, and I mean he didn't eat healthy right so <laughs> I, I had no concept of what respect actually meant and I find this is common uh so I'll tell you a, well, there's a couple of stories going through my head I have to tell you about uh, Kathy Murray's story which is uh, she was in her second marriage, a blended family with uh, you know, two stepchildren each. And um, they'd been sleeping in separate beds for about six months. Her marriage was in a bad way. And she was the CFO of a, a private school, a large private school. So she had a big job, a big prestigious job. And so she was using all the skills that had been really effective for her at work. Uh, at home to try to help her husband be better with me. She may help him. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah, I think right, in yeah. many ways it's the professional woman's dilemma. Like if we're used to handling and leading in our work context, why would we waste those resources in managing our marriage and family? Yes, exactly. I mean, why would you, right? So <laughs> the problem is <laughs> then you end up being... <laughs> In charge of everything, right? And then you, you can get a little overwhelmed. I mean, a big job is, is already a lot. So, uh, so he, she had just finished reading The Surrender of Wife. And, um, he came to her and said, okay, I need you to tell me, uh, what you want me to do with the cell phone plan. We need a new cell phone plan. And so she decided to use this cheat phrase that, uh, she'd read about in the book. Uh, and so she just turned to him and said it to him. She said, oh, um, Doug, whatever you think, whatever you think. And he just looked at her funny, like, you know, I know, you know, this was all in his head. I, I know I'm going to get in trouble if I don't do it the right way. So, and he, and he said, no, I need you to tell me what you want me to do with the cell phone plan. So she just stuck to this phrase. She was just doing an experiment. And she said, oh, yeah, whatever you think, I, I trust you. Now, in her head, she was worried he was going to screw it up and maybe like overpay or get crummy service or something. 
But Doug went away to uh, handle the cell phone plan, and, and he did fine. It worked out fine. And then uh, that night, he came and put his hand on her shoulder and said, you are so nice to me. And tears just <laughs> fell down her cheeks. They slept in the same bed that very night. And, and she'd been going to marriage counseling once a week by herself um, for a long time, just once a week to complain for an hour about her spouse, right? Um, and that nobody ever got happier that way, by the way. Nobody ever got happier. No, you can blow off steam or you can marinate a little <laughs> bit more, but either way, there's no transformation. There's no transformation. And honestly, you're really focusing on what's, you know, what you focus on increases. Yes, right? so yes, yes, yes of wrong, course. You're going to experience what's wrong. So anyway, uh, she fired her marriage counselor. She started training with me. That was over 20 years ago. She still gets tears in her eyes when she talks about how wonderful her marriage is, how tragic it would have been to throw out this man who is the love of her life. Really. Uh, and when she had the skills to interact with him, uh, and it's actually brought transformation to her whole family. Her, you know, her, their grown children, their, the whole family is very close because she practices intimacy skills with, in all of her relationships, uh, which is, I think, something we all want, right? To have those close relationships with everyone around us, our parents, our, our kids, our, our siblings, our colleagues, our, our friends, uh, and of course, in our marriages. Yeah, I'm actually reminded of a couple I coached and the man, this big-hearted, serious, logical man who was an engineer who said at the end of our first session, why don't they teach these skills in it's school? Cool. I learned math and grammar, but this actually is going to help me more. I know. It is. It's like a wonderful and awful, <laughs> isn't it? It is. Season it actually, <laughs> you know, we could go the direction of how awful it is, but really, for me, it means there's so much hope than yes. more than people tend to perceive. And that's significant. In fact, I'm guessing this is true for you too, but after the first session, pretty much 100% of the time, one or both people will say, when I ask, you know, how do you feel now or what are you taking away? It's hope. There's such a lack, like your mission to end divorce. I express this in terms of my mission is to change the cultural narrative on, around long term relationships. But we're getting at something very similar. And yes. so I yeah. think of you with all of your lived experience, your own, your clients, your coaches, and your book as really a beacon of hope for anyone who wants to turn towards that light, if you will, or that fullness. I think I'd rather say it that way. And actually... Building on that, one of the things that you say in your book, which I just adore, is that marriage is the best self-improvement project you've ever engaged in. And I have a question that I ask all of my guests based on the fact that I believe intimate relationship is the ultimate vehicle for personal growth. It's my version of saying exactly the same thing. And so in that context, I would love to know, even though you could say your whole body of work is the answer. But anyway, I want to go ahead and ask you anyway, Laura, <laughs> what have you learned about yourself as a result of being married to your husband, John? Yeah. Well, um, this is uh, an embarrassing story, actually. Another embarrassing story. I have many. Um, and that is that uh, early on, and even before I met my husband, I had a, a, a rage problem, I had a serious rage problem. I remember raging at my sister, my little sister, for locking my keys in my car and, uh, you know, raging at hapless sales clerks and bank tellers and certainly at my husband, uh, really just ripping him up and down the intention to do harm. And it was awful, you know. It was, uh, it felt uh, involuntary. I didn't have any sense of it being a choice. It just rose up in me and came out and... uh it was terrible. In fact, I think uh, one of my first memories of it is when my husband took us on a romantic getaway to Hawaii. Hmm. And uh, I was all excited. We were a pretty new couple. And um, 
So it probably, it might, it probably might have been the first incident of it with him where um, he, I thought, oh, we're going to go to the beach. I can't wait to go to the beach. And instead of saying that, he, uh, I, I said to him, what, what do you want to do today? And he said, let's go see a volcano. Let's go see a volcano. A volcano, Alexandra. I was like, <laughs> oh, okay. But I, I didn't want to have conflict. So I, I thought, well, I'm just going to suck it up and just agree to go see this volcano. I'm just going to be nice. Nice. So nice. And um, so we get in the rental car and we're driving. Through, and there's no volcano for a long time. You, just, you see uh, little molten rocks on the side of the road. Anyway, so I started to think, you know, I could have been, he didn't even ask what I wanted. And he, and he realizes something's wrong. He says, you know, is, is everything okay? And I go, did you think this would be fun? Because I don't think it's fun at all. I think it's stupid. And I want to go to the beach. But you didn't even ask me what I wanted to do. You know, it was, so he saw a volcano all right. Not, I mean, not the kind <laughs> uh-huh. that he was intending. But um, anyway, so uh, I feel sad, you know, for that. Younger version of myself just had no concept of how to say what she wants. And if you can't say what you want, you're never going to get what you want. And um, this whole sucking it up thing that, that you know comes out sideways. There's really it's never going to work. And so um, if I think about my marriage uh, as a dojo, right, as mm-hmm, the workplace mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, for for learning, uh, to developing my character really, which was it was inadvertent. You know, if I wasn't up against the wall, feeling that there was no escape except for this embarrassing divorce. I was never going to go through that door marked self reflection and self imp- self improvement. It was it was a gift really to have that desperation. Uh, and I I just remember you know my husband took me to the beach after that. We never did make it to the volcano. He turned the car around, we went to the beach because he just wanted me to be happy. But I couldn't enjoy myself because I had this horrible emotional hangover. And I knew if I continued to act like that, I was gonna I was gonna be alone. I was gonna be abandoned. I had a big fear of that. And so one of the things that has come out of practicing the intimacy skills is that I no longer rage. I really no longer, it's not a temptation. It's not, it's not in anything. I can uh, feel the weather starting to change. Like maybe it would go down that road and I'm able to arrest it. I'm able to be present for Laura. I'm able to uh, check with myself. Like, oh, what just happened? Like, oh my God, I'm I need a nap. You know, I march myself in the bed and then take one because I'm not fit for, you know, company with other people at this time or I'm able to express those desires, right? They're not coming out sideways anymore. Uh, I'm able to, um, uh, you know, hear the fear that's going on in my head, the thoughts that I'm choosing to focus on and I'm able to change that channel. And because I'm able to do those things, uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm so uh, relieved and proud to say um, I'm a I'm a safe person you now for uh, my loved ones. They don't they aren't they don't bear the brunt of my uh, my rage. That's so beautiful, and I know you're so effective in teaching others to pivot in that way as well. And I'd like to ask you what for you may be an unusual question, and of course, if you'd rather not answer it, you can either overtly or implicitly. <laughs> Let me know. But okay. when it comes to rage, that, of course, is not ideal. I guess that's being mild in how I say it, but I'm going to go with it. That it's not ideal to bring into a marriage in communication. But when I'm speaking with a woman who has, I don't mean uncontrolled rage, but what you're describing then I think the invitation is to learn to be self-respecting, peaceful, say what you want in a way that inspires your husband to give it to you, but not just eradicate or bottle up the rage, learn to redirect it in the form of passion during sensual, sexual intimacy. In other words, that's a magnificent fuel which is expressed in the wrong container when it comes out driving in the car, raging at your husband. But when you have access to that kind of a force, well, that's a pretty wonderful force to have access to when you're both fully present and making love. And I wonder if you have thoughts about that, that concept. It's interesting. I've never thought of it in that 
I've never thought of that connection before. Um, so, I mean, that's just fascinating, really, the idea of re rechanneling. I guess, um, you know, for me, the rage was ugly. It was, there's nothing, it wasn't passion. It was, um, it was victimy. It was, uh, I guess, I guess I'm, I'm just happy it's gone. Okay. <laughs> so when I think of, when I think about, <laughs> when I think about the, uh, the passion that I want to experience in the bedroom, um, yeah, maybe uh, I just, how person, do you maybe, distinguish that? Because the, the reason, how do I, oh, okay. Because the context of this question is that, yes, okay, rage, ugliness, being sort of taken over with disrespect, that's nothing to advocate for, but sometimes in the process of becoming peaceful and more neutralized, a woman loses touch with the erotic fire. Like those dials seem to be close by to one another, even though mm. they're not the same mm. dial. And so mm. maybe that's a better way to phrase what I'm after here. Because I don't, you know, I, we yeah. haven't discussed it. I haven't read something you've written, but I can't imagine that you're advocating neutrality in all contexts. Oh, oh, oh no. Right, not. right. I know you're no, not. No, no, no. I just, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Neutrality. No. Um, I mean, I definitely appreciate the peace in my home. And I, and I think I'm able to have that, uh, Partly because I am able to honor myself, right? So, but, so when, what that looks like in the bedroom, now that's been interesting. So, uh, I, one of the mistakes I was making in my early marriage was, um, like I remember, I remember like standing with my arms akimbo and saying to him, like, hey, the average couple, he's like trying to watch TV, the average couple has sex two and a half times a week and we haven't done it in like two weeks. So I think we should do it, right? And I thought he was going to jump up off the couch again and like, Sweep me into the bedroom, and there'd be all turned on by statistics. And, oh, that also never, never, right? Turned on. I mean, what could be more seductive, Alex, Alexander? Right? So, um, I uh, didn't find that was effective at all. In fact, um, so one of the things that has been uh, exhilarating, I guess, and uh, in, improved the passion is uh, I call it like turning the gender uh, dials to max. So if I'm showing up with a, a a feminine approach in the bedroom. And what is femininity? To me, it means uh, that I'm receptive. I'm receptive. So I'm not the pursuer. I'm not the, I might uh, instigate, but not initiate. It sounds so subtle, and it is. But uh, for example, I might just put on um, really, you know, really good underwear or something. And I might just be uh, laying on the bed in my underwear or whatever, my, you know, and that's it. That's I'm just, I'm just there like a piece of candy or something, right. That you might want to eat. And, uh, and that has, that has been really, uh, that has been really something for up leveling the, yeah, I'd say the gratification, the satisfaction, the excitement, uh, in bed. So that's, that's something that I find to be, so I guess when you speak of channeling, I think, one of the pieces of honoring myself is I actually have a, I have a feminine body, right? And it is built to receive. That's a kind of a metaphor, I suppose you'd say. Um, that, that idea that receptivity is the essence of femininity. Uh, and so if I'm in that receptive um, mind, body, and spirit, I guess you'd say, then I become mo more attractive to him, right? It's because men are fundamentally attracted to the feminine spirit and, and the feminine body. And so when I'm feeling that attractive, feeling that desired, that's a huge turn on for me. And then it's an turn on too. So I just having a good time. That's so interesting and lovely to imagine. And what I'm actually hearing from what you say is it's less about neutralizing, which I know isn't appealing to you, but that the shift out of rage has for you involved awakening to much more nuance and with nuance comes many flavors. Whereas rage is much more black and white and binary and that in eliminating it, you also accessed a whole range of nuance, which is delicious as you describe it. Does that sound 
mm-hmm. resonant for you? It does. Yeah, nuance. I would say vulnerability mm-hmm. uh, was lurking underneath that rage too, mm-hmm. and my my fear of being vulnerable. Uh, you know, the rage was a cover. I would say for that vulnerability. That um, uh, and then I have more. Yeah, I feel I'm more practiced at least. It still feels uh, scary to be vulnerable, but it. Yeah, that that's what I would how I would describe that means. I think is uh, kind of a. I mean, it's it's a, it's a lot more scary to seduce your husband than it is to stand with your arms akimbo and say we should do it. <laughs> totally, right? there's no fear. <laughs> and, and I also so. love that in what you've just said, you're not. Well, I don't know if you'd agree with this, but what I'm hearing is that you're not actually talking about putting a lid on the rage. You're talking about alchemizing it into vulnerability. Yes, alchemizing it. Yeah, I guess I think that's a good way to say it. It feels. I think from my perspective, it feels like it just left. Okay, it's fair gone. enough. I won't left the building, but I won't push that. But, but it's right. easy it's really for like, me. We, I mean, it's 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 intriguing for me to think about it because I don't want colorful people to feel like the color's gone from their lives when they no, lose the intensity no, no, no. of emotions. No, no. Oh, the intensity of emotions. Oh, that's interesting. Because, uh, yeah, I think vulnerability is a pretty intense and, you know, yes. feeling also, actually. Vulnerability, uh, yeah, it's terrifying, but exhilarating. It's an exhilaration that you can't get to. In fact, that is, I mean, that's another piece of the self-improvement puzzle, right, is having the courage to kind of run through that waterfall of fear for me and um, show, in a, show up with that vulnerability in my marriage is uh, indescribably wonderful and something you can't live without, I think, once you once you start to experience it. Because you get, I feel really seen, I feel really known. Uh, I mean, even when I'm, you know, I'm kind of a mess. I fall apart sometimes, right? And I still get to be loved. Uh, something quite like it. It's really all it's cracked up to be. Okay, that's magnificent. Then maybe we'll wind up on the exhilaration of vulnerability. And for anyone who wants to read your book, we'll have the links in the show notes. Anything else that you want to say about your book as we close up here? Um, Well, I mean, you know, if you're, even before you get to the book, if you want to get an overview of the six intimacy skills we touched on. Right. Uh, we ended up not continuing. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's right. Uh, you can get the, we have something really great actually, which is the adored wife roadmap, which you can download for free at lauradoyle.org. Uh, just get the, the roadmap. Uh, and then it'll give you a high level overview of the skills and also talk about the mistakes that most women are making trying to get their husband's time, attention, and affection. There's three really common mistakes that are painful to make. And I'd, I'd love to get that into the hands of every woman who wants to make her marriage last in time. Well, I'm sure it's well-written and inspiring and sure to be effective when implemented. I'm so grateful that you've shared with us today, Laura. Thank you, Alexandra. It's been a joy to be on your show. If you enjoyed this conversation, be sure to leave the Intimate Marriage Podcast a five-star rating and review. And if you want fun, effective instruction on how to create a lifelong, passionate marriage, the Aligned and Hot Marriage Program was created for you. This is my signature program, and it contains all the best practices I have developed. I've applied them in my own marriage with great success and seeing how helpful they are for the hundreds of couples I have coached. The Align in Hot Marriage program will give you everything you need to transform your marriage, turn it on, and feel more connected than ever in just eight weeks. Go to alignedhotmarriage.com and get started today.